Welcome to the Aiki Dojo Podcast. I am David Ito, Chief Instructor of the Aikido Center of Los Angeles. And with me is... Mike Van Ruth, Aikido Center of Los Angeles, Aikido Fourth Dawn, Yaido Fourth Dawn. And I am Bill D'Angelo, Aikido Fourth Dawn. <coughs> so Sensei Mike, uh, this is uh, our 4th of July uh, podcast weekend. And uh, I think we were talking before the podcast a little bit about that uh, this is our Freedom Weekend. And, uh, in America. In America. In America. This is freedom is the, is the theme yeah. of the holiday. And uh, it, it brought to mind for me the, the how does creativity figure into uh, Aikido and, 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 and martial arts? Oh, you mean Freedom. That is, that's, a, that's a difficult topic if you think about freedom in terms of Americans, right? If, like, for instance, like for Mike, if you want to know his password for pretty much any uh, of his platforms, it's 1776, <laughs> right? <laughs> freedom, because you know, he feels so strongly about patri- patriotism and freedom. And, you know, and that's hard because Aikido in the past was a traditional Japanese martial art. Right. Right. So being a traditional Japanese martial art, it is inherently rigid. Yeah, well, that's the thing is that, you know, Americans are s- – Americans, maybe Westerners. They would, in, in Japan, they would say Westerners because they kind of like uh, – Lump everyone the whole together. Thing, yeah, yeah, lump it all together. So in the West, we really th- – we, we have this idea of freedom, right? And in Japan, J- Japan thinks that there there's no America, there's no Europe. It's all the West. Hmm. And so – in Japan, freedom is not something that you you base you have. It's not a basic freedom, even though they are a, fr- a quote unquote free country. They are a very rigid country, and right. so falling into this idea of freedom and martial arts, there is at the very basis of a martial art or any traditional Japanese art, there is no freedom. Right, no, zero. But I mean, I, when I was thinking of creativity and Aikido. And freedom, I think we have to, if people are asking a group like ours, and especially someone like you who's been teaching Aikido for a long time, uh, people are going to ask about how Aikido was formed as a martial art because it's, it's an evolution of earlier martial art. And so even though it's traditional and it comes in, it's, it's lives in a culture that, as you say, has a certain rigidity to it, but uh, it evolved, and oh, since they created it in a sense, I mean, it was an amalgamation of certain jujitsu styles, certain swordsmanship styles. And so I think people are are gonna, if if someone's like looking from the outside into Aikido, and, and they think we're gonna talk about creativity, one place I think we could start is oh, sensei's creativity, and maybe just talk about that for a few minutes. Is that we we, we have the idea that martial arts is an art, and Oh, Sensei was an artist, I think, in the sense that there was this all this content that was modified, changed to create Aikido. I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, but that's am I the, off on that? You're not off. You're just in the wrong position. Okay. Right. So if you think about like um, Aikido, okay, Aikido was born out of Oh Sensei's enlightenment. Right. He he took supposedly he took the best of all these martial arts and put them together to form what we we know as Aikido. But even on a certain level, modern Aikido is not the same way that Osensei did Aikido. Right. Right. Because, you know, this person Osensei has a, a heavy background in swordsmanship. Right. And then in the old days, he didn't take students that weren't already ranked in another martial system or right. weren't from a samurai family. So then people came in with this already with this idea of how to move in, how to attack, how to hit things, you know, or they already had that samurai training. And then so today, as it spreads to the West, people don't have that same um, mentality, the mentality, bi- training, ability, conditioning. And so it's it's and then we say, well, we're all copying Aikido. So then what ends up happening is that because everyone's looking for ki no nagare, the flow of, flow of ki in Aikido, then they just start doing whatever they want, hmm. right? And then in reality, you know, you see, watch videos on 
YouTube or Facebook or things like that, people are doing techniques with like two and three grip changes. That's not that's not real. That's a that that's a training technique, but on the street, you get you are lucky if you get one grip change. So if you only get one grip change and you're used to, but I get I get this idea of why they do that, because they're trying to get your mind to flow. So they go through grip, grip change to grip change to grip change to throw or pin. But what ends up happening is that you start to think that's the way. So you go grip change, grip change, grip change, because I can do anything I want because I'm free. Hmm. But that's the hard part. Well, Sensei's Aikido is, is, has a basis. And because it has a basis, that's from that traditionalism it is where spontaneity comes from. But you can't just have spontaneity and no traditionalism. Right, so everyone talks about like Bruce Lee and oh, breaking the form, take what's good, throw away what's bad. That's wrong. I'm sorry, from an Aikido standpoint, Japanese martial arts standpoint, Bruce Lee is wrong. How dare you say How that about the icon Bruce Lee? <laughs> no, it's because thing is, think about it from a from a painter's standpoint, an artist standpoint. How are you supposed to learn how to paint if you don't even understand how colors are created? Structure. You have to have structure. So then you have to have structure in order to move forward. And then from once you master the form, that's where the creativity comes from. So when Bruce Lee says, throw away what's bad, keep what's good, he's telling someone who has no IQ, martial IQ, to uh, distinguish between what is good and what is bad. And then that's where the danger comes in because this technique, albeit would never work on the street, is perfect in the dojo because it teaches you a specific concept that your body needs to learn. But because you think it won't quote unquote work on the street, you throw it away, right? Like there is a, so there, there was a martial arts system. I mean, an Aikido system, Aikido school that took out Irimi-Nage and Ikkyo because the teacher felt like they didn't really work. So but the, there's a huge problem with that because those are, to the quintessential techniques of that define Aikido. Yeah, Irimi-Nage is the gold standard Aikido technique. So when you take away Irimi-Nage and Ikkyo, Ikkyo, Ikkyo and Irimi-Nage are probably the two gold standard techniques, and then you just took them away. So then what ends up happening? The person doesn't know how to, doesn't learn how to draw someone and move them around them and flow their key. They also don't really learn how to go do Irimi. Right, no entering. No entering because you, st you took away Ikkyo. And Ikkyo is a... Fa so there's this idea about uh, techniques being primaries or variations. And so Ikkyo is a primary. Mm -hmm. There is So you think about what's the difference between a primary and a variation. A variation is like... Um, a variation comes from the primary. But Ikkyo is the one technique where there is no variation. You have to change it in order to make it into a done technique. Well, isn't Ikkyo like, is, a, is a gateway to the other techniques and variations as well, correct? Uh, Ikkyo Irimi is not. It is a primary, and then you can't, you can't – once you move into Ikkyo, you can only change it. Yes. Duck under it, cut it down, move the arm. So let's say if you take this idea of Shihonage. You get into Shihonage. If you get into trouble, you can change, easily change Shihonage into Kodagaishi. Shi you know, into a kokunage, you know, under, over kokunage, any of those types of things, arm bar, without really changing the structure. Ikkyo irimi, you move in, the only way to change the structure is to duck under it or cut the arm down, right? So it's, it, it's a primary. So then you really can't go anywhere from there, right? So then if you look at, if you really look at Ikkyo, Ikkyo is the true standard of your own Aikido development. Because when someone attacks you, our, our, our primal response is to block, grab, or run away, right. fight, flight, freeze, right? But Aikido creates this, uh, this uh, fourth opportunity, which is to move in and harmonize. So the level by which you've developed yourself as a human being will be shown in how deeply you can move in without having to block or grab or anything like that. So that's when people are like, changing Ikkyo Irimi into all these different techniques, you can do that and you need to know that just in case you get stuck. But the thing is, it that shows your true development as an Aikidoist because if you can blend and move in and then drop that person no problem, you have arrived. So therein lies the problem. Is there, has to be, there has to be form 
before there can be creativity. Yeah, if you think about think about this idea of <clears throat> of being aware and have understanding things and be having knowledge. When I was driving here, a person there was a car, maybe a one car length or or a car and a half car length ahead of me in the next lane, and then this person cut. Th- uh, drove past me, cut in front of me, and then kept going. It was doing like 90, and I was doing like 70. And that's fine. The person got away with it. Mm-hmm. But what if that person who was uh, in front of him or her moved over at the last second, and then you ha- that person would have to move over? There's It would you know come down to reaction and all those things. But what, and what the person who's driving erratically like that doesn't understand is what is the, um, the minimal – amount of braking distance between you and another person when you slam on your brakes at 90 miles an hour. It's pretty long. So when you're cutting in and out of traffic or you're, you're um, you know, changing lanes, you have to know not just how much braking distance that you're going to need, but you need to know the braking distance of the person behind you. Because let's say you, you cut in front of that person and then that person's, uh, the person in front of you slams on their brakes. You may not hit them but then the person behind, behind you, you will hit you because you didn't keep the minimum amount of braking distance between you and that other person. So you can drive fast and be all crazy. That's your creativity. I'm driving fast. Look at me. I'm racing my Honda Civic down the street. Woo-hoo. Or you could be that person that realizes that, yes, I can drive fast, but how can I drive fast or drive in a way in which you leave other people options because that – uh, provides for your safety as well as theirs. But that's just, that's in everything that we do. There has to be a form. You have to know what the form is. And the form for driving is you need to know the minimum amount of braking distance b- when you're driving 90 miles an hour. And if you don't, and you're riding this person's r- bumper, and that person hits something or has a blowout right there, you and that person are going to go to the hospital, maybe even the morgue. But then whose fault is it really? That person who stand on their brakes? The person who caused the accident in front of them? You? The person behind you? It's your fault because you didn't ensure your own safety by adhering to the form. So if you understand the form, you know that you have to slide in and then slide over because there's not enough braking distance between the, the car that you went behind and the car behind that person. So you slide in and you get over one more lane so there's all this braking distance. But instead, you slide in, ride the person's thing. Closing off braking distance for you and the person that's behind you. Exactly. And then so you you broke the form <clears throat> because you're a great driver and you have fast reflexes because you're young and your Honda Civic has Brembo brakes. <laughs> but in reality, what could happen, and this is a martial arts thing, is you always have to kind of cover your bases. What could happen is that in the... In, the, in that moment, you have what we call an accident. You didn't intend for it to happen. That person didn't intend, intend for it to happen, but you had an accident. And that's because you didn't adhere to the form when you were showing your creativity. But that's not in everything. It happens in law. It happens in shooting. It happens in, in, in everywhere you go. You must master the form first. So is, is this, are, are we truly free? Right? I have to have a driver's license. So am I truly free? I have a question, though, about process. So I I don't know where I read this, but it was... I read it in a, what I, at the time, thought was a fairly reputable source, that um, there's, that the artistic process... there The psychologist ran a study about our, the artistic process in terms of trying to determine which... Um, process resulted in a um, more um, beautiful result and and it was these these two iterations one was and it was a pottery class they told um, the potters that you could make um, you know let's say over a week a uh, hundred different pots the or as many as you want and you could destroy them remake them uh, but at the end you know you could have as many as you want or um, to the other group, you you only could make like one pot, and what they found was the people that were able to make as many mistakes as possible 
uh, versus the person that only had like one or two pots to work on uh, ended up having a better result. Um, and I'm just curious, applying that kind of principle uh, to Aikido, do you think that 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 mentality of you know breaking things to um, get to an end result in creativity has any uh, application to Aikido? Not in the beginning. Not in the beginning. The, so, like maybe 15 years ago or so, there this girl came to do Aikido. And she came with one of the students that was a person who was already a student. And she was pretty good. She had been doing Aikido for two years, and she could could move really well. Mm -hmm. And so I said, oh, you should, you know, move this with your foot, change this with your hand. And I, you know, gave her pointers. Afterwards, the next day I asked her friend, hey, so what did your friend think of the class? And she said, well... She really liked the dojo and she liked the class, but she just wanted to flow. She didn't want to work on the technical aspects of the movement. Mm. And I thought, that's really interesting because here's that same thing. She just wants to move, make mistake, no mistake. It's Aikido, man. F- go with the flow, right? And so you just start moving. But then that's the part where you, you see, like, there's a huge component of lucky in martial arts that people don't really want to think about. That person who who wins this MMA fight, that person is lucky because they exploited a thing which worked out in their for their benefit. But they, but sometimes you're not that lucky. And so while you're just flowing, moving your hand any old way, that's how you flow yourself right into a trap. And a good martial artist is always digging the bear trap. You know, and and prodding you, poking you, moving you into that place to where without you knowing it, you fall into the bear trap by your own devices. And when that happens, that's where the person destroys you because they they watch the tape on you. They know what your tendencies are and they went, oh, this guy's got, ba- got a bad back. So if he's got a bad back, all I got to do is do a whole bunch of things which tire that person's back out. And once their back starts to hurt, they're going to become tired, and then their mind's going to become tired, and then that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to exploit on that person. So it, that's the hard part. If you, if you let people do whatever they want, you have to be sure that they're going to go in the right direction. And if they don't go in the right direction, they just went in the wrong direction. Right. Right? So, like, there are people that are adding other martial arts to Aikido to try to improve their Aikido, but... In the old Fru Sensei adage, how do you get good at Aikido? Practice more Aikido. Do more Aikido, right? But they go, oh, well, and I did this, and I, I practiced Tai Chi Sword to improve my own sword. And it's like, well, that's fine, except for Tai Chi Sword or any type of Chinese sword has a different cutting method than a Japanese sword. So your body is a different way, mm-hmm. right? And so, like, I watched this. Sh- you ever watch uh, Beat Bobby Flay on mm-hmm. uh, Food Network? You guys don't have kids. You have to. You don't have. To, you have to find stuff that's um, rated for everyone to watch. To so watch Beat Bobby Flay, I think it's Beat Bobby Flay. Yeah, something like that. And almost every time, so what you have to do is that they bring two well-known chefs or food people bring together two chefs to battle it out to see who's going to face Bobby Flay with their own signature dish. And so they show their 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 medal. The two judges decide who's going to challenge Bobby Flay. And then you challenge Bobby Flay with your own signature dish. And I, w- I, I bet you if you did like a, a calculation, Bob, Bobby Flay wins 80 to 90% of the time. And I think, how, do these, how does Bobby Flay win 80 or 90% of the time? When it's not even his dish. It's this right. person's signature dish. And lots of times he wins because he – shows his creativity and they do not so they go i mean this is a really good mac and cheese but i mean this one had like like kick this one and this one look good and this one does despite the fact that this is this person's signature dish right but then why did bobby flay win because it came down to cheating i don't know maybe not cheating but subjectivity right 
if you brought in a famous mac and cheese specialist where all they did was mac and cheese, they would go, Bobby Flay, lose. I mean, he put he put uh, Poblano chilies in it. They don't do that with mac and cheese. He'd lose right off the bat. But instead, you bring in a rest, a hip restaurateur with all these tattoos that goes, ooh, the f- so many flavor on so many levels. This mac and cheese has got the, oh, so great. And then the other guy with a traditional mac and cheese is like, but did you taste the cheesiness of my mac and cheese? Like, it's perfect from a mac and cheese standpoint. Mm-hmm. Oh, I lost. I didn't beat Bobby Flay. Right? And then largely, Bobby Flay loses because he made a mistake in his when he was putting it together. And then that's the only reason why he loses. But that's that same thing, right? <clears throat> it comes down to subjectivity. So then creativity is very much about subjectivity, right? Winning on a certain level is all about objectivity. Can you do this move and move in on someone because they're moving towards you? Oh, no, but I sidestep. I do this. I wave my hand. I do all these these extras because in the old – in in, the, in your in – your, um, training, it worked, you know, but like, did, have I ever told you the story about my buddy who was, who was, um, vying for black belt in karate? Which and, story? So my buddy in, in, in high school or not high school, but in college was uh, a brown belt vying for his black belt. And so he invited me to this, to watch him in this tournament and then the tournament, after the tournament, he was supposed to tr- um, take his black belt test. So he invited me to the tournament to watch his um, performance. And so he's he's fighting in this tournament. So the very first match is him versus, he's a brown belt, versus this white belt. Squaring off, he's trying to get some shots off on this white belt, and nothing's working. So then he does this thing where he spins both his wrists and moves his head like this. Uh, uh, and I, I would assume is trying to confuse this kid. Mm-hmm. And then the kid just, bam, right in the chest, gets the point. And my buddy gets so mad, he just punches the guy in the face. And they go, disqualified, out of the tournament. <sighs> and, I, and then afterwards, he comes up to me and I go, dude, what was that? And he's like, I don't know, man. Like, this kid, I couldn't. I just couldn't break his defenses, and I didn't know what to do. So I remembered that one of my seniors did this, does this to me in class, and it works. So I just did it on him, and I go, "But what is it even supposed to do going like this?" And then the guy got the point on you, and you're a brown belt. He's a white belt. He's like, "I don't know. I just I couldn't think of anything. So that's the only thing I did." So Damn. in that moment when he's doing this creative thing his his seniors do, well, uh, I'm doing this, whatever it is, it didn't work. And if that would have been a real fight, he'd have been dead, mm-hmm. right? And so that's where the this hard part about creativity comes in. You can be creative and throw something out there, but then that's the thing which sh- paints you into a corner, and then that's the thing by which your your opponent destroys you. So it still has to be structure. Uh, still has to follow structure. Yeah. Well, I have a you question start, yeah, for you, ahead. Mike. I mean, you're you're an artist. Um, in your daily life, what what do you think are the 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 experiences or the prerequisites to to getting your art done that transfer over to your Aikido experience, especially like as an Aikido teacher? Because you're an artist in your daily life as your career. You do art. Well, in the in the concept of of ceramics, there there has to be a form. Obviously, you know, through your own development, you kind of keep your work as you as you progress through. You may not look for, at some of your work from six months ago, a year ago, and then you progress to a certain point. You see the work, and you're going, I I don't know if I'm really getting any good. But you have a record of your progress. So you go back and look at that work from a year ago, six months ago, or whatever. And you're like, whoa! You're almost a little bit embarrassed. Be like, man, I made stuff like that. It looks so. You get f- direct feedback s- showing you, wow, I'm I'm progressing. But th- you have to practice that form to develop it to create something beautiful. It's the same way if you videotaped yourself doing Aikido back when you first started, and you don't look at it, and you go, I don't know if I'm really progressing. Trust me, you look back at that video, you're going to, oh, 
I was horrible. So again, you have to develop the form in, o- in order to develop beauty because there's nothing to hang it on. Yeah. Otherwise, if there's no structure there, it is. It's like watching a, a person who is doing um, free form dance. You can tell a person who has formal training in ballet and all these other things to someone who has no formal training at what whatsoever. You look at the two and you look, whoa, one looks clunky and one looks beautiful. So are you saying are you saying that, that there like for most arts or as well it sounds like also especially for Aikido, that to achieve one's best capability in Aikido as an art that um, one needs to be actualized to the experience with the teacher. Well, yeah, to, you have to, to create, experience the art. You have to create form, which builds upon beauty. Right, but otherwise but, there's nothing. But to there's experience void. that, you need a teacher. I'm just curious, like, in order to to actualize your experience as a martial artist, as an artist, that that has to be done through a form. And then to that get to that is form, to, you need a teacher to help you experience that form. Am I am I understanding that correctly? Well, well, even in art school, there's critiques. Right. You you make something, and it's critiqued by the instructor, by other students, uh, and then you're like, yeah, they had a point there. Mm-hmm. And then you work on that to kind of develop that or get rid of that flaw or develop that even further. You have to have this something that's pushing you forward. For Otherwise, progress. you're just going to stay right where you are. Well, that's that th- whole, this whole thing about being a prodigy. There is no such thing as, as prodigy. People think, oh, that guy's the prodigy. That's the prodigy. No, it's really the protege, right? The Through training is how you develop your eye to understand what's beautiful and not beautiful, right? Can you tell me what's beautiful about a Picasso, a Monet, you know, Van Gogh? No, most of us are regurgitating what um, R.H. Blythe said about Basho's um, haiku. Oh, it had this and notes, and you know, it's like most of us don't really know. So you need to have someone that helps you understand what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong. Because, you know, like for instance, I went, I saw, I know this person who does calligraphy, who's a martial artist. And when I saw his calligraphy, and you know he's been training for he's been doing he's been doing calligraphy for ten or fifteen years, hmm. and I thought, hmm, this calligraphy must be pretty good. Shoto style calligraphy, not a, not like a Western calligraphy handwriting, right? So Shoto, you know, uh, Japanese or Chinese brush calligraphy, and I saw it, and I was like, oh, well, it's he can flow. But he doesn't know where to start and he doesn't know where to end. And those mm-hmm. are the most two most important things is how you start and how you end. So how you start dictates the middle and your middle dictates the end. And then the end is where you, you, you show some flair. But when I looked at it, I was like, oh, this person can flow because he has the middle. But you can't see where the brush really started in a traditional sense. And then you can't really see where the, how the brush ends because the person has just went off the page, right? They just ended and took their hand off the page. But each one of those things, like if you write, write, were to brush the calligraphy for key, right? This beginning is very important because it sets up the center. But then at the very end, you drop down, come across, and then it whips up. And then that whimsiness is, it shows, your, shows how much you got left in the tank. Because what happens is you put too much ink on the paper for the first three or four strokes, and then you're left short at the end, or you or you're left short on the paper. You don't have as much paper, and then you have to like make this really small whip, whimsy thing at the end that doesn't look very well, good. But then once you learn the form, the form and calligraphy is you know how it's supposed to be placed. You know how it's supposed to what size is supposed to be in reference to the other characters. You know, and then everything kind of flows into each other like this. So you end one movement, it goes into the next movement, right? And then you can see that clearly in the in the calligraphy. But then this person, you could you look at it, you don't really see that. And you say, oh, is it different styles of calligraphy, kaisho, and all those sort of things? No, it was just he just it was just calligraphy brushed art. It wasn't. Chinese or Japanese calligraphy. Mm-hmm. You know, you were saying that one of the things that 
really made a huge impression on me in the first 10 years of my training um, was for instance, I used to sometimes bring out videos of his teachers. And you were talking about style. And I remember, you probably remember this, he used to occasionally show Ozawa Sensei's Aikido. And I remember it had this very distinct style um, that I had never, I mean, once I'd seen it, I recognized it very clearly. Um, but it, it had this um, very short, circular motion, um, and it almost seemed like magic. It was very beautiful. Um, and the reason I bring this up is I wanted to ask you, um, is it the case that at a certain point, and we brought, talked about this in the last episode about Shu Hari, is at the very high level, is what martial artist and teacher uh, Shihan's doing when you look at something like Ozawa Sensei, uh, where he has a specific kind of style? Is that the, the highest level of creativity in the martial art? Well, yeah. I mean, Ri is supposed to be the breaking of tradition, right? Breaking of the breaking of the form, and then that's where that creativity comes in. So, like a few years back. We were doing a teaching seminar on how to do the uh, shiruwaza from Ro Katatori. And this, one, another teacher was there. And then when he taught the class, I said, I watched him. I think, oh, he's turning toward the wrong foot. And I told him afterwards, hey, man, you know you turn towards the wrong foot. And he's like, no, I don't. Hmm. And I go, uh, yes, on a, at a higher level, you can turn toward any foot. Fight. It doesn't really matter. But to teach people the form, mm -hmm. you have to turn towards this this one Correct foot, fight. right? Because that teaches them how, you know, body mechanics, using their hips, all these different things. Later when you're flowing, yeah, you can turn any direction you want. You can do anything you want when you understand how how to create movement in ro kata tori or shiwaza. But like this person wanted to, uh, didn't really know that they were turning toward the wrong. And then when we look at Furio Sensei's video, he goes, see how it is so if you look at Furu sensei's later video i mean later on in that video maybe a minute or two later it, he's turning toward the wrong foot because he's going in he's in freestyle mode and then so that person saw that they thought that's the way you turn so they're not wrong it's just in the in, not in the proper position because in freestyle movement you can move any way you want because you understand how to move the person and that's what you're trying to learn how to do in a shiwaza. M learn how to m manipulate and move the person behind you. So to your point, to your question is that at what point do you start doing that? Right. And so today, once you achieve the rank, you start to do whatever you want to do. Right. And it's so crazy. People that get sixth on, boom, fifth on, boom, their heads get all big. You don't got to tell me what to do, you know, and all this stuff. They do and whatever they, they want. Or they go, man, Aikikai is like this. After Aikikai has already granted you that six-degree six black belt and you accepted it, now you're going you're gonna to criticize them? <laughs> Come on, man, that's like such poor form. It just shows how uh, it just, that's just not very polite to do, right? So if you're going to accept the rank, then you have to accept everything about Aikikai, right? But that's a different it's totally topic. A different topic. <laughs> but that's that thing. Like as soon as you're you rise to the level of fifth or sixth degree black belt, you think that you're you are now eligible to go freestyle. That's mm -hmm. not true at all. Right? And today at fifth degree black belt for me, I'm more traditional than I am creative. And I'm very creative. Right. I can I have I used to come up with all kinds of techniques, but the way I teach is very traditional. Traditional. But the way I do Aikido is very creative. But even then, I have to be very careful about the techniques that I teach because as they move away from this uh, this idea of being a basic technique or traditional, I have to be able to bring it back. And when I bring it back, that's what, ke that's what keeps me in line with being traditional. Where I'm like, okay, everybody, we're going to do some kickboxing techniques today. But you don't know anything about kickboxing. I know, but at, at the highest level, all martial arts are the same. No, it, they, they are. But they're all the same, at, and not in that same way. A kick, karate is not like Aikido at the top because we all learn how to kick at the top, right? That, they're all the same in the mentality. They're all in the same in body movement. Right. Right? But then you go, oh, yeah, when I reach the highest level at Aikido, now I'm going to start teaching uh, knife, uh, knife fighting. 
because knife fighting, they were all the same at the very top. No, like that's not the point, right? The point is that you can, you know so much about this one movement that you can take elements out to express your creativity and then still have the technique work and it seems as if it's magic. Right. Because there's stuff that Frusensi could do that... Seem like magic. Seem like magic. Yeah. But then you start to show that and then everybody wants to do that. So yeah. shodons are trying to like draw people no touch. Is it... There's a, a problem with that, too, because, again, you talk about I, the way I teach is traditional because you're going to lead students astray, especially new students, because they're not going to differentiate between, oh, that's uh, re rather than the structured. Yeah, my creativity. Yeah, my creativity. And like that one person, I didn't turn her towards the wrong foot, but if you show them the wrong things, they think that's the way, and then it leads them astray, and then they wonder why they have a problem in the future. Yeah, I mean, that's – and that's – and then we become a we come be, we come to accept um, being mediocre as the way, you know. Like we talked about in this th- in, the, in the in the effectiveness podcast um, the other day, we were talking about you know seventy percent of the time people miss. Right? There are people that commented on that. There. That seems acceptable in in baseball. Thirty percent is a very good uh, hit average no one's yeah. dying in baseball yeah no one dies in baseball right and they, so first sense used to have this yaido uh, instructor named ebihara sensei who was this old school um swordsman who fought duels in china when the, when the japanese occupied manchuria and he could do this technique where he would jump was it two tatami he would jump uh, one tatami six feet. So he would jump like one, one or two tatami and then cut a nail in the, in that, that they had n- nailed into the floor. He would, he would leap and cut this nail, right? So you, in that moment when he's in the air, he can't be thinking, well, if I only hit this 30% of the time, not that, not that big a deal. No, I bet you in that person's mind, he must hit the and cut that nail every time and then when he he doesn't he's disgusted with himself Mm -hmm. right like when they said that mitsuzuka sensei for sensei's yaido teacher would do the very first form in yaido uh what shohato he would do it a hundred times every morning and then he would be satisfied if he could get it done perfectly one One time one time out of that because it's so hard to do perfectly right mentally physically and all these things. And so you think then that's a 10%. He's, he's, he's 1%. Oh yeah. 1%. He's okay with 1%. Well, he's okay with 1%, but that's not, we're not talking about from a dueling standpoint. We're not talking about it from a fighting standpoint. We're talking about from a mental development standpoint. Yeah. So we talked about this idea of Ikkyo being a barometer for your Aikido ability, right? So if you can move in on the person, and not get all scared inside and not, you know, resort to uh, violence or succumb to your own fear. That's t- saying something about you as a human being, right? But we're not saying that you should be able to move in every time that way because that's – we're not – those are two different things, right? The form uh, shows what our true level is. So if you can you can stick to the form of moving in, ikyo, iri, mi, or mote – properly and then not become afraid or not succumb to your fear and start being rough and, and, and resorting to violence, that demonstrates something about you as a human being. You're saying that, that, that our ability to do certain techniques like Ikkyo reflects who we are as a human being. Um, I keep thinking of the teachers that were very, very senior when all three of us were very young in Aikido, like Kanai-sensei, Ichihashi-sensei, Hozawa-sensei, um, for his sensei, that if you know, if you close your eyes and open and, and see one of these people with their face blocked out, that all of us could probably recognize their technique. And um, I'm wondering if is it the case? It, it, do you think that 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 the style, their artistic expression, is? somehow is a unique representation of how each of us is in our Aikido. 
Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, you, like, it's it, like, are, what you're, are you asking if each one of those styles of Aikido is a representation of each person's personality? Yeah, I think so. It, it is a representation of that individual's personality. Right. Right. But then we, we, we look for, what do you look at? What do you look for when you look at Aikido techniques? Oh, man, it worked. Oh, man, that guy did this. Right. That's fine. People can look at that. Oh, that's this or that. What I look for is at what point did they get frustrated and then their true level comes out? Hmm. They got frustrated. They got became physical. At what point did they flow? At what point when the, per, the uke made a mistake in the uke, ukemi did that person get flustered? And then you look for stuff like that. Oh, because now what ends up happening is you just do something – and it works or it doesn't work, and then you go, oh, that's because I'm flowing. And so every, let's, every, let's all try it like that to cover up the fact that you made a mistake, right? And so that's the hard part. So is it a rep- each each person – and, you know, mind you, uh, this idea of self-development and your Aikido technique is has always been there, but most people don't talk about it. Mm-hmm. And the reason why they don't talk about it is because most people don't want to develop themselves. No, it's too hard. So then you discount that, yeah, yeah, that's not true. But if you look at it, it's so true. When I look at Shihans today, I look at people and I think, why does that person with 50 years of Aikido and being 6th, 7th, or 8th Don uh, black belt have to be so rough? Man, that guy's like 75 years old. Why is he going to be all rough like that? And that's not because I'm judging them, but it's just that do I want to be that way when I'm 70 years old no man my back already hurts i was gonna say once you break 50 it's like man watching that hurts you imagine what you're gonna feel like the next morning why do you want to continue to do that to yourself why because in that moment it's it comes down to ego so creativity is all about your ego so in the old days the teacher tried to suppress your ego as much as they could so that in that moment when they're gone and you're left to your own devices you have let go of this desire to flex your ego. And that's what happens is today people are so creative on the internet, so creative on YouTube, so creative on Facebook because they're trying to, they're flexing their egos, you know, and you think, I look at the techniques and I go, that's cool. But where, I mean, where are you going to go with that? But they showed it and then I have to go, well, that was a demonstration technique. Right. And then you go, you think, but that's the hard part. Like you look at some of these famous quote unquote shihans today and I look at them and I think, dude, you're over the age of 60. Do you need to be that rough? You haven't, you haven't developed yourself to a certain level that you don't need to be rough anymore. Right. But most people, it, they never do. And then that's why they quit at a certain age. You just because, can't continue. Yeah, because they can't continue to do that technique the way they, they like to do it because it worked and it made them feel good about themselves. And it's no different than a person just getting all this plastic surgery because they're getting old. And then they go, oh, my looks are fading. Well, I got to just get a new face. It's See, I kind of think of it from a more metaphorical sense that wouldn't it be really interesting if, um, I mean, you're the chief instructor, so I, I kind of think about it. Imagine if we could inspire students and teachers um, that we were to take the idea of being a martial artist seriously as an artist and that as, as Mike is talking about like with ceramics that you're really polishing your craft so like when I think of this I'm not a sculptor so I'd, I this is all anal- metaphor and analogy for me but imagine like you have you know you're you're making Michelangelo's David and you've got this marble and you go from a rough to a, you, you, iterations and you keep polishing and polishing and polishing and that you've got this project you're working on and you're you're trying to continually make these better iterations you're getting continual critique and it has this project to it that has integrity and um concern um and continual reflection uh i think like i think that we gloss not necessarily the three of us but i think martial arts as a class um, uses the word artist but often doesn't think of the implication the positive implications of what that means for all of us as students and as teachers like if we could activate that word artist in all of its positive dimensions we could we could like 
really make a huge impact. Because I look at like, you know, the way you you do a double service as the chief instructor in this dojo, because well, it's actually triple service because you're preserving the heritage of Hombu Dojo. So you have O Sensei and Kishimura Sensei and uh, present Doshu, and then you're preserving Furu Sensei's Aikido, and you're teaching your Aikido. You have three layers that you're teaching. That's a huge um, curriculum, um, and so. Having to do that, real I think using the the model of being an artist is a really good paradigm, uh, and I just think it's a great idea to activate all the um, sort of algorithms of being an artist, trying to act you know to to take all that and impart it to the student. Yes, but that's the idea about being an artist, right? What do they say? Uh, Michelangelo's David is not. Uh, you know, do you know that quote where they say it's not that it's not what you put into it, it's what you take away, which right. makes the statue, mm-hmm. right? And that's the thing about the difference between uh, a first degree black belt teacher and a six degree black belt teacher. That well, one of the things is that a, a six degree black belt teacher is trying to eliminate things to say, yeah, take away things so that it becomes this pure thing, while the person who showed on it is trying to add things. Add things to it so that all these things. But the thing is, you add things for your ego. Well, I better put a flare here. I better put a dot there so that people will like it. This I'm going to make this so it looks like a Picasso so that people will buy it. Right. Right. And that the the hard part about being a teacher is to sh- let go of that ego and then try to do as little as possible to influence the end outcome. So you're trying to take away, take away, and take away. I really like that idea, and it reminds me of something that you were telling me and Mike and Maria about um, queuing, uh, and how you were saying that it was actually you working with Mike and me in Iaido, and you were talking about queuing. That um, maybe you could just explain that again, like if you could just walk through that about how to queue, talking about queuing and teaching, um, because I think that 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 instruction. Um, is for me it was very helpful, but this idea of taking away as a part of the artistic process, um, this structure artistically, I think, is something that we really should talk about as artists uh, and from a learning process. Well, that's the hard part is that most people don't think of themselves as an artist, right? But what is the what is the art that you are creating yourself? Yourself as a, as a work of art. I think Furu Sensei has always talked about this idea. But like you're, you're assuming that everyone wants to be an artist when most people don't. They go to uh, the pottery class. They, they make the form of what everyone else is making. And they take it home and say, I made this. Right. And then everybody goes, whoa, you made that? And you go, yeah, you know. Don't put water in it, though, because it'll leak. <laughs> <laughs> right? But then that's that, that thing. On a, on a, in a martial art, there is nothing like that. Because when you go to your car and someone accosts you, you either know it or you don't. don't. Mm-hmm. You, either, you either can move and do something and save your life or you don't. And Aikido adds this other layer of trying to save the assailant's life, the opponent's life. And so that's what makes it more difficult to be an Aikidoist than it does any other style of martial arts because every other style is about destroying the opponent. And Aikido no is about concern. preserving the opponent, right? Because the opponent, they are you, you are them. Right. We are all just one. There is only one key in this universe. So then everyone is the, an, an iteration of that same key. So you are me, I am you, same with you. But we don't see it like that because we just like to destroy things. But why do we want to destroy things? Because our ego says that that's the best way to do it. It's an interesting observation because, and this I pose this question to you, Mike, is that do you, I think often is do we think of art as having a moral component? Uh, I, mean, I think we, I think art does have a moral component in the sense that, like some of the best art um, has moral messages. Like Pablo, you, you were talking about Picasso earlier. Like his one of his most pa- famous paintings is Guernica, which was an anti. Um, war painting about the Spanish Civil War. And obviously a lot of his paintings have no moral component, but some of the best artwork... That you know of. 
that we know of, right? But a lot of the best art has, you know, 1984 anti-totalitarianism. Um, but some of it doesn't. But I think a lot of a lot of art can have m moral components to it. it. Doesn't necessarily have to be political morality. But uh, I think it's interesting you're talking about how I. Aikido has this because my sense of what draws so many people to start Aikido is this essential difference that Aikido distinguishes itself as having concern for all human beings. Yeah, but that, that concern is not something that you can concern yourself with in the beginning. No. It's you too, know, too much. You, you guys got to eat me and knock that person's teeth out, right? Like. Because in the end, you have to first preserve your life. Right. But then that's where you, when you start to train, you're like, oh, yeah. And then later, as you start to realize yourself, you realize that you suffer. Other people must be suffering. So if they're suffering, should you destroy them? Right. And so then that, this idea, if we think about creativity, it's the creativity is the, is, has a huge component of courage. Because the hardest thing to do is to... Have courage to be yourself, right? And so when you want, does, does anyone want to destroy anyone? No. But we learn and are conditioned to real to think that uh, being mean or being a bully or violence is what gets you what you want. So that's the hard part about creativity. Is, is yeah, The height of creativity is a certain level of courage that enables you to paint a picture of something which you don't think anyone's going to buy. But that's what it's, it's not about anyone buying it. Mm -mm. Like there's this famous Chinese uh, saying, birds live for food, um, man lives for fortunes. Mm -hmm. And it's the idea that you can't, it's really hard to hold out indefinitely. And so you have to have the courage to hold out. You have to have the courage to be creative to say, I'm going to paint this painting because this is what I, I need to, I feel has to come out from my soul. And most people are like, I don't have that courage. But you have to have that courage to let it all out so that you can bring this art to the world because art is supposed to change the world. Art is not just supposed to be something you hang in your house and go, oh, it's a Picasso, it's a this and that, it means this. No, you bought that paint. You're supposed to buy that painting or buy that sculpture because it, it resonates with you. Mm -hmm. It change, You look at it, it changes you. And that's what true art is supposed to do. And then so we, if we say... Everybody who does Aikido has to have that. It's like a little bit too hard to force people to be artists when they go, I just want to, I just like to be in train. a room with nice paintings. I right. just like to be around people who paint. I, I'm not really looking to be an artist. But it's that you, you hope that they would try to make an art out of their life and become creative and then create something that changes the world, that come, create their life which changes the world. Right, but that's the hard part. Is it? Is that the thing you talk about in the beginning with your student who's going to start on the first day? No, you're like slide forward, slide forward, mm -hmm. slide forward, <laughs> slide forward. Okay, slide forward, put your hand up. Slide forward, put your hand up. Slide forward, do this, and then. But that's the thing is like if you when you're asking about me talking to you two about cueing, you you, you, you t usually give one to three cues. Right. Just slide forward, turn, step back. Right, not slide forward to the forty-five degree hypotenuse of the triangle. Right. Make sure that you do this. There's too many words for the person's subconscious to remember. So you you give them a process. Here are the steps: slide forward, turn, step back. Slide forward, turn, step back, and then you step back. And then as they slide forward, you can say them as they're sliding forward: slide forward, turn, step back. And then what you're doing is reinforcing the cue in their mind, so that. They never have to rely on you for a slide forward, turn, step back. And then they start to master that movement because they can say it to themselves when mm -hmm. they're at home. But if I talk about the, for, the hypotenuse or the 45 That's degree angle, do those no things. No one's going to remember that script. And they're going to they're gonna need you to reinforce that for them. And so you will always be there because that person can't move with, unless you tell them to move. No, I'm not creating robots. It's, well, other people might be. But I, at this dojo, I don't, I don't want robots. I want free thinkers who are – have mastered the form and now are trying to break the form because they've mastered it. And so that free thinking is that, okay, so now what? Now where are you going to go? And that's where the creativity comes. What's the next technique? That's where the four and five grip changes comes from. And then, and then what? 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 Because I want to see their creativity, right? But then they go, I don't know what's next. 
I don't know, what would you like me to do? No, I want to see what you can do. But that's that thing, right? Like if you're going to be creative, it has to be in the right place. If you still paint by numbers, I can't ask you, I can't commission you to paint my portrait because that's going to suck, mm-hmm. right? I need a, I need a, uh, an artist who's been doing this for 30 years, grinding it out that, that paints the picture and he goes, oh, I didn't get the, the hue of your face correct. You know, and then they want to go back to the drawing board. Drives them crazy. The other person goes, "Hey, man, nude is nude." (laughs) And then you go, "That's I don't know the 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 Pentel box said nude, so I use that." And the person's like, "I'm African American." You go, "I don't know, whatever." How do you think, uh, especially like the first the Shodan exam, the first black belt exam? uh, Do you think it maybe it's too basic? But how do you think creativity plays into the first black belt exam? It does not. It, it does not play into the exam itself, because you're showing, you're demonstrating form. But the creativity is in how you got to that place, right? How did you prepare yourself? I prepared myself the way everyone else prepares themselves. Every, everybody in my dojo is six foot four, and I prepare myself just like they, they do. You're like, whoa. So if you look at like some famous Aikido teachers, who will go, who will remain nameless, he has a student that's. A foot, almost a foot shorter than him, but then the student still does the aikido just like the tall teacher. When you're a shorter person, you think that's wrong because the thing is, like, like you know, I'm not that tall, and some of you guys are over six feet. So I always give you a correction that works well for someone being Each over person. six feet. Yeah. But if you only did aikido my way, you'd be a six foot tall person doing aikido like a little five foot tall person like me, and right. then your aikido would be very small. You wouldn't know how to extend because your extension doesn't look like my extension and you would just never extend. But that's the hard part. Like you, when you're preparing yourself for your Shodan exam, it, the creativity comes in and how do I teach, how do I get all this knowledge in my head and in my body and then let it come out on test day? So you think, well, Bill said he came to the dojo every day when he was leading up to his black belt test but i have a job and kids mm, i guess i i don't know okay honey and then at the end you got your show done but your wife's like i want a divorce and you're like well at least i got this black uh you know obi around my waist no like th- your wife doesn't want to celebrate on the, on the day you pass your test because the test was more of a burden for her or it was more more of a burden for your husband right so that's the thing is that you have to go well you know, based on my schedule, I can do this. Right. Based on my physical ability, I can do this. But then so, I still have to. I still have to get to that same place that everyone else gets to. So then I have to use my creativity to get there. Yeah. So what you're saying is that first year you black belt, second year you black belt, first Q, all these things are exercises and problem solving. So that your creativity yeah. is how to you learn how to solve problems and obstacles. Uh, which are unique to every person's circumstances. Yeah, and then that process is supposed to change you. So when I took my Shodan exam, how I prepared for it, you you would not, both of you would not be able to prepare the way I prepared. So I already trained 14 hours a week um, up to the point of when I started pre- preparing myself for Shodan. On top of that, I prepared another 7 to 10 hours physically. And the way I did it is that I would go to the gym, I would set the treadmill on its highest setting, like 14, 14.0, and I would walk on that treadmill holding on, sometimes, yeah, most times holding on, and then I would visualize the test for one hour. Mm. This is how the test is going to go. This is from here. And then you do this. And, this, and then at any time where I fell asleep and lost my place, I made myself go all the way back to the beginning. Wow. And visualize how, everything that I'd be doing for the test. And I did that one hour plus every day, seven days a week for uh, a year and a half ish, right? But then I needed that to get the movements in my body. On top, I mean, and then mind you go, well, you did that because you didn't train. No, I still trained over 12 hours a week. And that means every day, some you know, and then we we train three hours on Saturday, Saturdays, Sunday. two hours on Sunday, and then every day, and then you came early, stayed late, so all these hours all accumulate. Those accumulate. But then the thing is, is that 
that I used that was my creativity, right? Because I had to figure out a way to, to figure out how to do these techniques when there was no guide. Right. And then I, like we talked about in the last podcast, I built myself a, um, a cheat sheet and then I memorized the cheat sheet so that I would know exactly where I was supposed to be, what I was supposed to be doing at every time. So by the time I took my black belt test, I had already taken that, the black belt test, you know, two, three hundred times in my mind or more. Mm-hmm. Interesting. It's just that idea that you, you'll have to do something to get it into your own body. Right. And sometimes go, coming to class every day doesn't work for you. And so you have to figure out a way to get it into your body. So what do you do? You think, well, I have a learning disability. I have, uh, you know, one leg shorter, one leg longer. I have bad knees. I have to, whatever it is. You have to think about what the problem solving pro- portion right. is to it and come up with a way to overcome your thing, whether it be a bad knee, mental problems, drug, drug habit, whatever it is. You think, okay, well, I got to stop smoking crack for at least a year. Right. And then your Aikido saved me. It stopped me from smoking crack, you know, whatever it is. But like you have to find some way to maneuver your self, your, yourself out of the problem that you're having so that you can pass this test. Right. So rather than developing, so maybe for some for some people and some teachers, developing a personal style is maybe the the apex or the height of their career, but maybe a for the, for the most people, the 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 most amazing outcome is self actualization, so realization of their best life, rather than style. Well, that's, we talked about this in the previous fo- podcasts that, you know, a person will take one class and then, and then th- th- like this, this person took one class and then he came back and said, uh, I'm going to quit after this, at, at the end of the month, he came back and said, I'm going to quit. We're like, okay. And then he said, I'm going to become a fireman. And then in my mind, I'm like, why did that person join anyways, if they're just going to go off and become a fireman? And trained to become a fireman. And then I went, oh, yeah. Sometimes martial arts empowers you to change. And sometimes for some people, all it took was one class. Right. To my own detriment, right? Because then that hurts the dojo financially. <laughs> we don't have many people on, this, uh, on the mat and whatever. But that something about it was empowering. Right. Right. And so you have to just l- let them go. Let them become that person who they are. But that's... That's the hard part about creativity and where it comes in and where you allow it to come in. Right. You know, like there's this time where I was helping someone fix the garage door spring on my mom's garage door. And so the side that he was working on was already broken. And then the side I was working on wasn't broken. The spring was still taut. And so I was undoing the bolts. It's bolted to the wall because I didn't know any better. Oh, and so man. I have my hand overhead. And oh, z- 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 I don't want to hear this story. And then it broke from the wall, and then I just did coke you like that. And then it went bam. And then people that were helping were like, oh. And then, like, I'm holding up this garage door spring with my coke you. And then they came over and pulled it off my arm. And then I had this, like, these, this one Holy bruised God. bone line. But my, look, think about this, though. What if I didn't study martial arts? Yeah, you'd lose an eye. My hands were like this, right in front of my face, like this. You know, my right in front of my nose with my elbow down. Yeah. My hand had to come up and do this to do kokyu. If my if I wasn't trained, like bam, that thing would have knocked me out cold. Yeah, and, and that's had, not a conscious thing. No. It's a automatic. Yeah, that garage door spring, you know, whipped, and then my hand came up and and blocked the strike, so to speak, right. But that's that conditioned thing. But if I wasn't conditioned through form to, to, to move my hand like that, I might have lost an eye. I might, be, I might have this permanent divot in my forehead or whatever. It is. I might talk like this now or something like that. But because I, I studied a traditional form, right, my hand can move like that. You know, and, and so then what you have to say, where's creativity? If... I didn't adhere to that form, and I was just being creative all these years doing martial arts. I would be, I might be permanently injured. Yeah. Right. And then that bruise was there for like five years, a long, long time. I would just go the the imprint in the arm. You still the, feel it. Was gone, 
But I would push on the bone. I'd be like, oh, bone bruise. It was there for a long time. It's not there anymore. This was two decades ago. But, like, that's the thing, right? If you didn't master the form and you were only being creative every time you went to class, my hand might not have been at the right, right place at the right time to save my life, right? So that's a hard part. If people be, are creative, their creativity has to come in at the right place, which benefits their Aikido, not right. the wrong place, which is a detriment to their Aikido. In order just to fulfill their ego. Yeah. Just, oh, I, I feel good. Did you see me do this thing? Oh, I pushed that. Yeah, I was pushing people down with my one finger. Well, okay. To me, whenever people show stuff like that, I think, oh, you shouldn't show things like that. No. You know, because you're leading people astray. You think, oh, I'm going to be able to flick my finger and the person falls down. I'm going to be able to touch them on the face and they, they fall down knocked out. Great. No, those are, in the old days, let's say it's true. Let's, let's just say it's true. Let's not talk about it being fake. Let's just say it's true. Then you should hide that because you don't want your enemies to look, watch how you do it some really astute martial artist watches you, studies you, and goes, I know how he did it, and then can copy you. Because that's what the old, mar old school martial arts was supposed to be able to do. That's why there were never any public demonstrations prior to the Meiji era, 1868, because you were training people in martial techniques to be used in the battlefield. Right. Right, in the defense of their, their lord, their clan, their whoever. And so there were never public demonstrations of your art. The only time you demonstrate is if you dueled. And so a person would come into your school to dojo yabare to fight you, and then you would just you would hopefully destroy them and win the match. And then largely when that happens, that person feels bad and has to join your dojo and become your student. Likewise, if they beat you, lots of times they broke your kaban or your sign, and then your students became their students. Right. And this is now their school, and you were shamed. But so that's why, like, you think when a really good martial – the reason why they didn't have demonstrations is because a really good martial artist could watch you, study you, and go, that's how they did the technique. And then – They steal it. They steal your technique. Or they would come up with a a counter. Um, a counter. Like, you ever yeah. see uh, one, the one-armed the one -armed swordsman? No. Jimmy Yu, I think his name the, – you know, he's got one arm. He gets his arm cut off. He's studying swordsmanship with this famous teacher and – um, he, his father saved the sword teacher's life and so the sword teacher took him in and he was a student there and, but he's poor and everyone there's rich and then the teacher's daughter is in love with him but then the two head students who are wealthy are jealous so she wants him to fall in love with her but he just wants to train so they he's and they keep riding him and making fun of him so he's going to leave so as he's leaving the, the daughter tries to stop him and gets mad at him and then cuts his arm off. And then he runs away. They break his uh, father's sword. No, his father already had a broken sword from the, from the previous battle to save the teacher. So he takes his father's broken sword and his one arm and runs away. Right? And so year, years later, he's all destitute. And then this girl he's with gives him this book that's burnt. And all it has are the left hand or the right hand movements with one sword. Because the rest of the book where they incorporate the other hand is burnt or, or, or not there. So he copies this book, becomes really good with this broken sword, and then he learns that the enemy of his teacher is going to come kill the teacher and is killing all the students. And how are they killing all the students? They figured out a method to um, beat, them, beat their best technique, which was like this sword which had like a scissor move. So whenever they blocked, the sword would scissor – Hold the sword. Oh, I remember could, this. And then yeah, they would gut you, <laughs> right? So then he jumps over the wall to save everybody, and they can't use that method on him. On his he sword. said no arm. No, because he had a, his sword's broken. Yeah, oh. it doesn't have the doesn't have the prong. And then so they they he ends up killing all the people and saving his teacher, right? But that's that same thing, you know. As we think about like, how could this person get really good at this? Where's the creativity involved? If you show your technique. You know, so we're talking about the hoo hoo, and this person falling down. A person, a really astute person, could watch it and go, "Oh, oh, I see it. I see how they did it." And then they could they could come up with the counter, or they could use that same technique on you. Right. So that's like if you see the movie Paper Tigers, right? The, about these three derelict students that finally come back after this teacher gets killed, and they're all adults now. The bad guy kills people with this like death touch 
poison poison palm poison finger yeah. thing hits them and then the guy hears it and would have would have been nice if it they brought that full circle and that when the bad guy used it on his buddy the other guy stepped in and did the opposite which counteracted the poison finger poison palm thing but they didn't but that's the point is that if you can see it you're you're supposed to be a certain level of martial art that where you can see it you can steal it hmm. and so that's why showing your creativity or showing anything other than the form you run the risk of it being stolen by another good martial artist so that's why you have to be careful well i think ultimately Again, there cannot be true beauty in creativity unless it's structured on form. Otherwise, it's chaos, essentially. That's true. I think, I think what I've taken from this and what I still think about is what you, what you distilled, which is that... Uh, Martial arts is this very, very unique experience where the practitioner is both the artist and the work of art. It's this very unusual dynamic. And before we did this podcast, I didn't think of that. And... Now that I'm thinking of that, I'm like, that is a really an interesting insight. Um, and I know that I'm going to leave today really thinking about that deeply. Uh, and, you know, I, I started today thinking that the martial artist is an artist uh, and that you practice on yourself. But that that we're ourselves a work of art is is, is, is it's a it's a very deep insight, and mm. I think that one that um, Aikido specifically, because we can practice at different levels and in different ways our entire life, um, it's something that we can really work on. So this this insight, um, which uh, you brought out today, uh, which I didn't have coming into the podcast that um, in Aikido the martial artist is both the artist and the work of art at the same time is this really amazing dynamic um, you know it's similar to dance um, but before you brought this up I hadn't really ever conceptualized it this way and it it really shows um, the the amazing depth of Aikido and the opportunity we all have to develop ourselves through our, the entire life of our practice, uh, and uh, it's yeah, it's an insight that I feel gives me uh, and uh, both as a practitioner and as a teacher to to really work hard to develop. And that's that idea that Free Sensei was talking about that uh, martial arts. In martial arts, your life is the art. Your life is the mm -hmm. is the yeah. work of art, and that do you really want to be just tearing people's eyes out, you know, breaking people's arms as your art? That seems it seems so futile and petty, right? But that you as a human being, and that once you've mastered the form of oh, you know, don't lie, cheat, steal, or be bad, then that that's where the creativity comes out. Right. How can I be more generous, more kind, more more compassionate right and then that's where the true art comes out where you see this person who helps someone even though it's going to be their de detriment right like they showed this guy who was uh uh like 1930s uh, olympic swimmer that he ran into a house that was on fire saved all these people that that were in there but then it hurt his lungs and he could never swim again oh. right but the work of art was him running into this building saving the people that needed to be saved, the children and stuff. But had he been selfish and only about destroying others, never would have ran that building. He got an Olympics, but yeah. those people would be dead. Yeah. But that's the hard part is that, like, you know, the work of art that you were creating is yourself. And so that's where you Aikido teaches you, oh, do I want to kill people? Right. 
you know, and you think and that's where creativity, the creativity comes from, is born out of this idea that, oh, it can kill others, but the thing it's really killing is the self. Yeah. This is ethical challenge that we all have on every day. Yeah. And so that's where, that's the role of creativity in Aikido. Yeah. Well, I think it's a good place to start, a uh, stop. We've been at this for over an hour. Um, thank you for watching or listening to this podcast. And don't forget to like and subscribe or, or leave comments in the comment section about things that you want us to talk about. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.